Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries when it comes to the sun. Or various star emissions, such as solar flares or coronal mass ejections, that have recently become extremely common, mostly because the sun is now entering some of the highest activity in the last few decades. And because of this, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand exactly what happens on the surface of the sun, especially because this does have a chance to affect the technology on our planet. But we're also going to discuss some of the new studies that propose really intriguing techniques on how we can study the sun even better, and briefly discuss some of the recent discoveries, as well as discoveries from other similar stars that essentially suggest that we are kind of lucky. Compared to a lot of other similar stars, our sun is definitely a little bit calmer. And now let's actually start with this particular discovery coming from a slightly different star system. A star system not so far away from us that contains two sun-like stars. One is a G-type star, and one is a slightly smaller K-type star. Stars that in theory should be kind of sun-like, both in mass, in luminosity, and of course in their overall emissions. Although in this case, this particular star system known as V1355 Orionis is also a binary system, which generally represent the much more common types of star systems out there. There are just over 50% of binary stars and just under 50% of single stars. And the smaller K-type star seems to be a little bit too active. Recent observations of the star system revealed that it actually created an extremely powerful solar flare, with the emissions moving at approximately 1000 km per second, three times the escape velocity from the star system itself, resulting in the coronal mass ejection of trillions of tons of material all at once. In essence, equivalent to all of ice on planet Earth. If you were to combine all of the ice shelves and all of the glaciers, you'd get approximately 1 trillion tons, which seems to be approximately 10 times more powerful than the most powerful solar flare and CME the sun has ever produced. Which I guess makes us a little bit lucky. A star system producing so many flares and so many CMEs is unlikely to have any planet orbiting even far away that could sustain livable conditions for more than a few million years. In other words, an Earth-like planet is very unlikely to exist here. But, in the solar system, the Earth has stayed this way for billions of years. Which of course implies that the Sun, for the most part, has been pretty mild compared to many of these stars the scientists have discovered out there. Despite of this though, in the last few years, just as predicted by various studies, the Sun seems to be entering one of the most active solar cycles in the last few decades. You can learn a little bit more about this in one of the previous videos in the description, but in essence, even though cycle 24 was relatively weak, the current cycle, cycle 25, might be one of the most powerful cycles in the last 3 to 4 decades. As became pretty apparent from a lot of different observations in the last few months. We discussed one of these major emissions relatively recently, but not so long ago, just in mid-March of 2023, the scientists have also observed huge solar tornado right on the surface of the sun. It was actually over 100,000 kilometers in length and was essentially generated by extremely powerful magnetic fields coming from the sun. And that's of course just weeks after one of the most powerful emissions that was already observed that released a very powerful coronal mass ejection but luckily headed away from planet Earth. We discussed this in the previous video, but even though it was actually headed away from Earth, it ended up affecting our planet nevertheless. Although here I think I need to clarify something. There's always a bit of a confusion between CMEs, solar flares, and the overall strength of these phenomena. A typical solar flare, which is what you're about to see right here, is basically an extremely powerful emission that's usually classified on the amount of X-rays they produce, and obviously this is something that travels at the speed of light. They're generally classified as five different types, with types C, M, and X being of most concern, and it's usually the X flares that we're kind of concerned about. In terms of the actual power produced, the difference between M and X is approximately 10 times. But although solar flares can be pretty dangerous, it's really the coronal mass ejections that are of the most concern. The thing is, they usually are connected. Whatever produces solar flares has a really high chance to produce CMEs afterwards. But CMEs are not light, they don't travel as fast. And they're usually formed as a result of a kind of a snapping mechanism inside the magnetic lines around the sun. This snapping then releases a huge amount of matter, highly charged matter, that's headed somewhere into outer space. And it might take days to reach planet Earth, but when it does hit planet Earth, it's as if the planet is suddenly bombarded by a huge stream of very charged particles that dramatically decrease the overall effects of the magnetosphere around the planet, and obviously produce various effects on the surface, including the iconic Northern Lights. 
And on top of this, in the last few years, the scientists have also identified various unusual events, we currently refer to as Miyake events, that potentially represent something that's somewhat similar to what the scientists have just observed from the binary star V1355 Orionis, the star with that ridiculously powerful emission unseen in modern times. And so the scientists today actually want to figure out if our Sun is capable of something somewhat similar. Obviously one of the missions studying this is the Parker Solar Probe, currently approaching the Sun even closer. And one of the more common questions I get about the probe is, is it doing okay? Is it surviving all of these emissions and all of these coronal mass ejections? Well, following all of the emissions from the last few months, it recently reported that everything is going as planned, nothing has been affected, but the data from these emissions has not been sent to planet Earth yet. So unfortunately, the science and the observations from these coronal mass ejections and various flares experienced in the last few months has not been analyzed yet. But obviously, studying the Sun is kind of important if we want to try to maintain the current way of life and basically want to use technology for hundreds of years to come. A single one of these coronal mass ejections, in theory, can actually stop everything. Nevertheless, the scientists always find new ways to try to study the Sun, which is pretty much what this recent study is all about. A new intriguing way of potentially studying the Sun in the future once our current technology improves just a little bit. Specifically technology in regards to detecting gravitational waves. Yep, that same technology that we've used to detect first ever black hole collision and the technology that's now been upgraded and updated even more to help us detect even smaller objects out there. And as of now, we mostly just focused on various gravitational effects from very powerful catastrophic collisions of various black holes and neutron stars. But in theory, everything can actually produce gravitational waves. And some objects, such as pulsars or spinning neutron stars, in theory can produce gravitational waves that are extremely predictable and can be used for a lot of different accurate measurements. And one thing about these waves that make them super super interesting for various studies, just like X-rays here on planet Earth, they can generally be used for scanning. In other words, they can go through matter without really being affected by almost anything. Or in other words, just like X-rays that help us create an image from inside your body, gravitational waves can be used for very similar purposes to study various objects out there that cannot be studied otherwise, especially when they don't actually allow electromagnetic waves or light to pass through. And we're not just talking about distant objects such as black holes or something that's maybe a little bit more theoretical and not easily observable. In this case, we're obviously talking about something a little bit closer to home, the object you see behind me. And so in order to study our own sun, currently there's really only one technique. It's known as astroseismology or helioseismology, and it kind of relies on a similar idea to how we study the internal structure of planet Earth, the sunquakes. You can learn the details about this technique in one of the older videos in the description. But in essence, that's at the moment the only way we can study the sun and figure out what's going on on the inside. But there is obviously another way. We know that various massive objects, especially the ones that spin, produce powerful enough gravitational waves that travel across our entire galaxy. And quite a few of these objects produce very predictable observations that can be used as a kind of an X-ray. At the moment, the scientists have discovered about 3,000 different pulsars in the galaxy, and about 500 of those very likely produce repeatable gravitational waves that could be used to study everything around us. It just so happens that three of these, every single year, pass behind our sun. Which basically means that as the sun passes in front of them, the gravitational waves in this case will be shifted just a little bit due to lensing effects produced by our sun. These minute changes should be detectable with these new devices and thus can allow us to actually see what's inside our sun using nothing but gravitational information. And the more of these objects we find passing behind our sun, the more accurate picture we can eventually produce. And at some point, all of this can become so accurate that we can actually have a very detailed picture of what exactly happens inside the sun itself. Now, this is just a pioneering study describing this technique. And here they used only three different pulsars, but their estimates suggest that this would be an extremely accurate procedure, assuming that the gravitational wave detectors become upgraded enough to be able to observe these types of waves. The three pulsars investigated pass in front of the sun in the following locations. And although only three objects have been investigated, the scientists in the study believe that hundreds of these objects probably pass behind our sun in our galaxy alone. And so once these gravitational wave detectors are accurate enough to detect all of this, we're probably going to have a new technique on top of astroseismology that can help us study the sun even better. But I guess more importantly, possibly even help us predict 
some of these future CMEs and solar flares. Because that's basically what it's all about. New strategies, new techniques and new analysis in order to predict some of these events days, weeks or maybe even months before they actually occur. In order to help us prepare for any potential damage. Although at the moment it's still probably a technique that's years away from being effective and from being something we can use to study the structure of the sun. Anyway, once we learn more or once the scientists figure out how to make this work, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining general membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.